So, uh, of course, what we'd like to do here is to sum first and then integrate. Invert uh, the order of uh, our uh, sorry, of uh, integration and summation. So, uh, what uh, we ha so how do we justify this? Well, there is a result which says the following. That if our so if our fn are measurable and positive, then as a consequence of the monotone convergence theorem, we know that we can invert things. Okay, so that's quite useful, and that's the case here because. What we have here is a continuous function for every n, and uh, it's therefore Borel measurable, and uh, we and they are positive because uh, square root of sine x is less than one, and therefore and cosine x is positive between zero and pi over two, therefore this is positive for every n. And so we can just invert things. Now, uh, we have no guarantee that we'll find a finite result. We may very well find infinity, but that's not a problem, okay? So we get that our, this is the integral of this uh, series. Of course, it's a geometric series. So we get one over square root of sine x cosine of x uh, dm once we have uh, integrated this thing. Okay? And now, uh, now we have a small problem which is that we have uh, an improper, well that this, this function, this is an improper Riemann integral. Okay, we have a problem at uh, uh, at zero. However, uh, I did point out last time that if you are talking about a positive function, then the improper Riemann integral is equal to the corresponding Lebesgue integral. Again, by using the monotone convergence theorem. Because what I can do is just put 1 over n here. Okay? If I put 1 over n here, I'm fine. Because now it's a continuous function. And it's equal to the corresponding well, maybe let's do it, and you'll see how. But it always works like this. So I, I will not do it every time, but we can do it a couple of times. So what I'm saying is that this guy here is uh, the same as the uh, Riemann integral. Okay, this is because of the theorem we, we stated that told us that a bounded function which is a, a Riemann integrable on a bounded uh, uh, interval is equal to the Lebesgue integral. Okay, the two integrals are the same uh, for this class of function on this class of interval. So we can just write that this is the same. Now, here we use the fundamental theorem of calculus. Oh, thank you. Here we use a fundamental theorem of calculus, and uh, we see that we have f to the power minus half times f prime. So an antiderivative for this thing is 1 over 1 plus 1 half, which is 1 over 1 half. Uh, f to the one half, which is sinus x to the half, uh, taken between one over n and pi over two. So that's going to be two times uh, one minus sinus of one over n 
to the half. Okay, so this load bag integral is equal to uh, the Riemann integral. And now what we do is we say by the monotone convergence theorem, because as my n increases, this interval is bigger and bigger. And because this is a positive function, my function is bigger and bigger. OK? Uh, this is really converges to this thing. And this converges to 2. So that's what uh, our integral is, and that's what our result is. So you don't need to redo the argument every time. If your improper Riemann integral is positive, it's going to work every time, because every time you'll be able to use the monotone convergence theorem. So you don't have to worry about it. You do have to worry about it if your function is not positive. Then you don't know. It may very well be that you the two things are not the same. Okay, and so you, the fundamental, the, the, the important result we use is this one, okay, which is a consequence of the mountain convergence theorem. Again, it's very important for the Fn to be positive. Otherwise, we cannot use the mountain convergence theorem. Number two, so again we are looking at the Lebesgue measure, and we have a fault. And well, what this is telling me is that uh, Fn converges to F in L1 with the terminology that we saw last time. Okay, this is exactly what it means to converge in L1. And we'd like to show that Fn actually converges to F almost everywhere. But we know that that's not, uh, uh, the implication is not true in general. So we need an argument. What we have here is that not only Fn converges to F in L1, but it converges rather fast because we have a rate here, and you can sum this rate. And that's what the fundamental thing is. So first thing, uh, what we can, so, uh, okay, the first question was, show that the series is finite almost everywhere. Well, what you do again is you, you look at your series, so you look at your series of integrals first. And then you invert your integral and your series because, again, you are talking about uh, measurable positive functions. Okay? What you're doing is taking measurable functions, subtracting them, and then taking absolute value, which is a continuous operation. So all of that is fine. Therefore, you get that this is a measurable function, right? Because you are doing fn minus f, which is a phi of fn minus f, where phi is continuous. Okay, so when we do uh, a continuity, uh, we compose a, continuit a continuous function from the left uh, of a measurable function, we get a, a measurable function. So that's okay, and therefore we can rewrite this thing as being the integral of a series. Is finite, and this by uh, so this tells me what this tells me that uh, this tells me that the series 
fn minus f is actually integrable. Okay, because I take the integral of this thing and I find a finite number. And it's integrable. Normally I should I should take absolute values, but I don't need absolute values here. Okay, because my definition of integrable is in integral of the absolute value of a function finite. Here it's a positive function, no need for absolute value. Well, but the function which is, which is integrable, we know, is finite almost everywhere. Do you remember this result? Okay, it's one of the inequalities, and maybe I should reprove it afterwards, okay, to remind you of this result, because it's very important. Okay. So this thing is finite almost everywhere, which tells me what? Well, that for, so it means that for almost, for almost every x, I have that the series fn of x minus f of x is finite. Okay, this is what it means. Therefore, it means that for almost every x, fn of x minus f of x converges to 0 as n goes to infinity. Why is that? Yeah, it's the divergence test, right? If your series converges, the sequence must go to zero. Of course, the converse is not true, as uh, the series 1 over n shows, uh, but uh, you do have this. Well, and that, of course, implies that the same as saying that fn of x converges to f of x for almost every x, which is another way to say this is this. So my tip to you probably uh, misled you, and uh, I apologize. I, w I was thinking about something else. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So that that shows uh, number two. Now, yeah, let's let's go back to this fact. We we did prove it already, but it's it's important to. Keep that in mind. This is the type of inequality that and, oh, actually right. Oh, I actually will use three to do that. Okay. So for three, we have a following. We look at uh, the integral of f so on some measure space, uh, x and mu. And we say, well, this is certainly larger than f bigger than a, when f d mu. OK, because it's a positive function, I'm restricting the domain. I get something smaller. This is larger than a over f bigger than a d mu. Right? It's something smaller because I, on f bigger than a, well, uh, I get something smaller if I replace uh, my f by a. And this is a constant, so it's, this is a mu of f bigger than a. Okay, so very simple inequality, but very important. Okay, we use that all the time to go from measure of a set to integral of a function. Okay, it's, uh, in particular, in probability, this typically represents a probability that you compute thanks to uh, an integral which we represent, for instance, the expected value of your random variable. Okay, so you have this important relation between the two. 
Okay, now uh, a consequence which was not asked, but uh, let's, let's apply this. Assume now that the, the integral is actually finite. Okay, if it's infinity, it's not very, a very interesting inequality. You get that infinity is bigger than something, well, which may be finite or infinite, but that's always true, not very informative. If your integral is finite, it becomes more interesting. Because then you, you do that, your, uh, you get, the, let's do n equal a, or a equal n, and we get that mu of f bigger than n is less than 1 over n, the integral f d mu. I'm using exactly the same inequality as before, and I'm looking at this now. Now, clearly, I can sandwich my uh, mu of f bigger than n between the two numbers. Uh, and since this is assumed to be finite, this goes to 0. By the way, there, there seems to be some confusion about, uh, uh, it's not related really to this, but about this uh, 0 times infinity equals 0. That's a convention we have when we are talking about the measure of a set which is infinity, times a number which is 0. That, by convention, is, is taken to be 0. Now, what we are not saying is that two limits, one going to infinity, one going to 0, will give you 0, because that's not true, even with the Lebesgue theory. Okay? He cannot do that. Okay? So be, be careful about the convention, what it really means. So we know that this guy goes to 0. As n goes to infinity. Fine. Now, what else do we know? Well, we know that uh, the sets are decreasing. Okay, it's more and more difficult to be bigger than n as your n increases. And we also know that mu of a1 is finite. They are all finite, see, because of this inequality here. Okay? Because mu of a1 is less than the integral. And the integral is finite. So it's because I have a finite integral that I have this property here. Well, we know that with these two, we can pass to the limit inside the mu. Okay? So we know that the limit as mu goes to infinity of an is mu of the intersection of the ans. Right? Now, what is the intersection of the ends? How can I be bigger than n for every n? Well, the only possibility is to have f equal infinity. That's the only possibility. Right? If I'm bigger than n for every n, it means that I'm not a real number. Okay? And um, uh, that's, that's almost the definition of what infinity means. And if I'm in here, of course, I'm bigger than n. So this is uh, an easy double inclusion. And mu of my intersection is 0, which means that mu of my f equal infinity is 0, which I can rewrite as f less than infinity almost everywhere. So I'm allowed to have uh, the infinite value, but only on the null set. Questions? OK, so that was for number three. And the application is, uh, holds for when this integral is fine. Sorry, uh, why is mu of a1 fine? 
because a mu of a1, so let's, let's retake this guy here and plug n equal 1 we get that mu of f bigger than 1, that's by definition a1, is less than 1 over 1, which is 1, integral of f d mu. But this thing is supposed to be fine. Okay? It's because of this inequality. Okay, so number four, we're looking at a function capital F. So first thing, uh, how do we know that this is well defined? How do we know that this is really a finite function? Uh, well, we can, uh, we can use the same trick as before. We can first start by saying that if I look at 1 over n1 of this guy, this is actually the uh, Riemann integral of this. Right, because it's a continuous function on a bounded interval. So I know that the two things are the same. And then I look at my Riemann uh, integral, and uh, there are several ways to do that. My only problem is as uh, x goes to zero, we have a ratio of these two guys goes to one. So this is equivalent to that as x goes to zero. Okay, do the ratio, you find exponential tx, tx exponential tx goes to one as x goes to zero, whatever it is. So uh, this tells me that uh, the convergence of the improper integral is equivalent to the convergence of this improper integral. And this we know how to do, because uh, if we look at this guy here, we get 1 over 2 thirds x 2 thirds between 1 over n and 1, which is 3 half. 1 minus 1 half to the 2 thirds. And of course, this converges to 3 half. So this shows that this converges to a finite limit as uh, n goes to infinity. And this converges to f of t by the monotone convergence theorem because, again, we are dealing with a positive function. So that's how we prove that f of t is finite for every t. Questions? Of course, there are other ways to show that the improper uh, Riemann integral is, uh, is, is finite. Converges. This is the best one, that's all. I'm not serious. Maybe there is a better one. Okay? So that's for A. That's for A. Now, what about B?
So we want now to show that this is a differentiable function uh, for every t. And the first step is to take the derivative inside the integral and we respect to t and we get exponential tx x x minus one third. So we get x two thirds exponential tx. Now, a priori, this is not a bounded function. I mean, as your t goes to infinity, this is going to blow. So that's not what you want to do. What you want to do is say the following. Let's fix t naught. And uh, let's, let's just assume that t naught is positive. But you'll see that the argument works equally well for any t naught. And we, we are trying to show differentiability at t naught. So what we're going to say is simply that on, for t on uh, t naught over 2, uh, 3 t naught over 2, so some interval including t naught, we have that x 2 thirds uh, exponential t x is less than x 2 thirds exponential uh, 3 t naught over 2 x. And I don't need absolute values. I got rid of my t. Now I have a t naught. Now I have something which doesn't depend on t anymore. Of course, it depends on the particular t naught you have, but that's OK. Because you are trying to prove a local property. So you put yourself in a local neighborhood of t naught, and you show that the theorem we, we stated last time holds. Now, the way we stated it is a little misleading because you get the impression that you have to find your bound for every possible t. And that's not possible in a case like that. So it really, uh, you, you need to be a little careful about that. Now, the thing is, that our bounding function which is this thing here so our bounding function which is x to the two thirds exponential three half of t naught x is integrable on zero one okay, this is a continuous function on zero one, so uh, it's integrable. So we have our bounding function is integrable. It's independent of t. We have something which only depends on x now. Now that t naught has been fixed, therefore uh, the theorem applies, and it's a consequence of the dominated convergence theorem. Uh, we can say that the derivative of f exists, and is. So you, you would take the derivative inside, and that's what you get. <laughs> of the dominated convergence theorem? And you, you can look at the proof in the book. It's theorem 2.27, page 56 in the book. Okay. OK? 
Now, uh, number So we're looking at the integral of our function on the subset f bigger than a. And we want to prove an inequality for that. So what we do is we write this thing like this. Okay, either f is bigger than a or it's not. And then we we say what? We say that this is bigger than so I want what do I want? No, I want one to be smaller than okay. So uh, this is less than Uh, a, well, maybe I should not go so quickly. A on f less than a d mu. Okay, this guy is less than this. And so then we get f less than this. Here a plus a mu of f less than a, and this is one less than this plus. Oh, it's for the bag measure. Okay, so it's the Lebesgue measure uh, okay, so what I'm saying here is that this is going to I can replace this by a, and the reason I can do that it's because m of the x's belonging to zero one so that f of x is less than a is really is uh, less than m of 0, 1, which is 1. OK, I'm, I'm in a set that has measure 1. So the maximum measure I can get is 1. Therefore, this is a true inequality, and we get part A, right? Because that's what we wanted, that this inequality is bigger than 1 minus A. Now, uh, let's prove that, in fact, inequality is strict. And in order to have, uh, OK, if, if, the if in order to show, so by contradiction, assume that Um, we have that 1 is equal to the integral f bigger than a plus a. Assume that we have this. Then it means that m 
of f less than a. Sorry for switching mu by m on you. Uh, I hadn't realized we were talking about the Lebesgue measure. But so mu and m are the same thing. Uh, so this would imply that the m of f less than a would be 1. Okay, because that's what our bound is. It's 1. So in order to have equality, I need this thing to be exactly 1 which means that uh, f is less than 1 than a almost everywhere. Right? That's what it means. The measure of f less than a is 1. And then you take your integral on 0, 1 of f, and you say, well, then this is true as well. But then you have an integral here which is 1, and an integral here, a, which is strictly less than 1. So you get your contradiction. That's because we assume that A is strictly less than 1. That's why. Uh, otherwise. Questions? So the review is interesting because you have several inequalities that are very useful and that you'll see on the, on the test. Uh, it's missing a little bit of dominated convergence theorem. There, is, uh, there will be more dominated convergence theorem. But your, your homework, the last two homeworks I just handed back to you, have these problems. Make sure you know how to apply dominated convergence theorem. There may be some fat two as well, okay, which again is in these homeworks. Questions? So the test should look like this review with, of course, variations, but uh, I, I think you're, you're seeing the main techniques. That's uh, really what you need to be able to do is to manipulate these integrals to see the relation between measure of a set and the integral. Uh, that type of uh, idea is very important. OK, so let's take a short break, and then we'll come back and uh, uh, start uh, uh, product measures. <laughs>